We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. I feel hunger in your hearts today. I have hunger in my spirit. No, not blessings. I want you. And here's the, the unique thing about that. If we have him, we have the blessing. But in our world, sometimes we seek the end result rather than, we seek the gift rather than the giver. But if we seek the giver, anything we have need of, we have. And his presence is saturating this place. Welcome to early service. I'm so glad you got up early to come to early service. And uh, thank you for doing that. We're going to be petitioning, seeing how many people we can get to come to early service next week. Because for the next two weeks, hopefully, if something extraordinary doesn't happen, the Greens will be with us. They were scheduled to be with us, but due to circumstances beyond anybody's control, they weren't able to be. But usually we pack it out. So if you can continue to come to early service during the revival, and we'll see if we can get another couple dozen to come to early service, that will give us plenty of room to continue worshiping. Thank God for his goodness and his grace. I will be turning in the Bible to the book of Zechariah chapter number 10. This is one of the minor prophets. It's only called a minor prophet because of the length of the book, but he had a major thing to say in chapter number 10. And if we get to that point, we're going to just look at the anatomy of all of chapter 10 at the end of my, my uh, uh, sermon today, but uh, there's a passion in my heart, and, and I know that this was supposed to be revival service, but I believe that God has given me something to preach to you uh, that will lead us up to that point. We don't, uh, uh, an evangelist doesn't bring revival in his pocket. You know, it's just like, here you guys, you know, I'm paying you for this, and I'll, I'll just pull it out of my pocket, and here it is. No. And I've talked to evangelists many times that I've pastored for over 35 years. And so I know that if we don't prepare our hearts, it doesn't matter what the evangelist preaches if the church isn't ready. And, uh, and our evangelist, Brother Green, knows that. And there is a working relationship we have together as a church. And we know we connect well. He just fits well in this pulpit. He gets the character of this church. And so we're ready for that. But here's some preparation that we can do. And we can, ha we can experience an outpouring of the Holy Ghost today. In Zechariah chapter number 10 and verse number 1, he says, Ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. Can you say that word everyone? Everyone. To what? Everyone grass in the field. God is wanting to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. He has He's not wanting to restrict the outpouring to Portland or to Sacramento or to New York City, but every field is going to have grass or a harvest. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. The first four years that I pastored, I pastored in an area where they had dry farmers. I'd grown up in an area where we had wet farmers. In other words, they plant the crops, and then I remember going out with my uncle, and we'd... Uh, uh, put canvases down in the ditch to block the ditch so the ditch would fall, flow over. or the can And then we would open up the floodgates in uh, uh, the canal. And those floodgates would allow water to come from the canal into all of this series of ditches and it would flood the field. And that's how they were watered. But in Canada where we lived, they were dry farmers. They relied solely upon the rain from the heavens above in order for their crops to flourish. And there was a need for rain when the crop was first planted so that the crop would grow and it would come out of the ground. But then there was a need shortly before the harvest called the latter rain, and that was to bring the grain into fruition or to fill out the head of grain. Perhaps there are a few in this congregation that prayed as I prayed in recent days, Lord, please send the rain today. We wanted the fires put out, and thank God they're slowly dying. But most of you, I'm sure, are very content to accept the weather as it comes to you. 
Most days it doesn't matter what my desire is. The weather behaves as it wishes. At times I, I have prayed for God to change the weather and I dare say that it, it could have been classified you have not because you ask a mist that you may consume it upon your own lust. And at other times I've wondered if a farmer was praying at that very moment for rain when I was praying for it not to rain. See, sometimes it's difficult to tell if I am praying in the will of man or the will of God. But the purpose of my sermon this morning has little to do with the will of man and everything to do with the will of God. It's crystal clear by the declaration of the prophets inspired by the Holy Ghost that God wants to, God plans to, and God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. It just depends on whether we want to be recipients. And I believe there's a conclusive evidence that it is God's will for we, you and I, to pray for rain now in this season. It is not only the will of God for you and me to pray for rain now. There is a formula for success that is given to us in the Holy Scripture. I repeat the admonition from the concluding conclusion of the prophet of the Old Testament in Zechariah 10 and 1. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone, grass in the field. One of the most quoted verses in Pentecostal circles is one of promise. And it refers to the first outpouring of the Holy Ghost. In Joel chapter number 2 and verse number 28, and I love to read this, I love to hear it read. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. It is right that we refer to this scripture often. It's a passage to which Peter referred to on the day of Pentecost. He quoted this section of Holy Writ. But I want us to notice that in verse 28 it says, And it shall come to pass afterward. There's something that had to happen first before there was a Holy Ghost outpouring. And we are reflecting on the former rain, which was on the day of Pentecost. And we rejoice in the continuous outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But I am expecting an even greater outpouring in our day than any other time on the history of earth. God is, there's more empty vessels on earth alive today than there ever has been. Over 7 billion people. I remember when they said there were 3 billion people on earth. And it was just like, three billion? Really? Will it ever, will, will we crowd out the earth? No, God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. That, that was his command. You just let well, God worry about it because if we're doing God's will, it doesn't matter how much food we need. God will supply all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You see, we, we need to take the paradigm of God, not the paradigm of men. So I want you to look at the verses preceding this great verse of, verse of promise. And in these are contained the answer for a great outpouring in our day. And I'm reading from the message translation in Joel chapter 2 and verse number 16. He says, get everyone there. Consecrate the congregation. So he's calling for a solemn assembly. And he says, get everyone there and consecrate them. Consecrate means to set yourself apart unto God. In other words, there'd be a time of repentance and clearing out who, uh, what we have done and say, okay, God, I'm standing before you. Make sure the elders come, but bring the children too, even the nursing babies, even the men and women on their honeymoon. Interrupt them and get them there. So this is an urgent thing because traditionally, and don't anybody cop out on this, uh, is that they'd get married and for the first year of their marriage, they would just be left alone and let do whatever they want and they didn't have any responsibilities. But he says, no, I want everybody here. 
between the entrance and the altar. Let the priests, God's servants, weep tears of repentance. Let them intercede. Have mercy, God, on your people. Don't abandon your heritage. Don't let the pagans take over and rule them and sneer. And so where, and so where is this their God? The gift of promise is preceded by a passionate prayer meeting. The only way we're going to have an outpouring if we raise our voice to God. We've got to repent between the porch and the altar. We've got to be submitted to God. I have to be. You have to be. We are all kings and priests to God. That's our responsibility. There's no way we can minister healing and to the nations unless we have been and healed ourselves. The great outpouring required great prayer. Unified prayers of repentance always move the hand of God to action. This principle was established at the dedication of Solomon's temple. Read along with me and wonder at the response of God found in Joel 2 and 18. And that required great prayer. God went into action to get his land back and he took pity on his people. You see what happened? Our land, the only answer for America is Jesus Christ. The only answer for the fire in the street is the reign of the Holy Ghost. That's the only thing that is going to change you and me. I've said it dozens of times. There's no way we'd be in one room together if it weren't for the Holy Ghost. That's what makes us one. By one spirit are you baptized into one body. In verse 19, God answered and he spoke to his people, look. Listen, I'm sending a gift, grain and wine and olive oil. The fast is over. Eat your field. I won't expose you any longer to the contempt among the pagans. I'll head off the final enemy coming out of the north and dump them in a wasteland. Half of them will end up in the Dead Sea and the other half in the Mediterranean. There they'll rot a stench to high heaven. The bigger the enemy, the stronger the stench. God is working for us. God is on our side. Oh Lord, send the rain. Send the rain from heaven above. We need a Holy Ghost deluge. And he goes on and says, fear not earth. Be glad and celebrate. God has done great things. Fear not wild animals. Uh, the fields and the meadows are greening up. You see the fire comes and the pestilence comes and whatever. But God's in control of it all. The trees are bearing fruit again. A bumper crop of fig trees and vines. Children of Zion, celebrate. Be glad in your God. He's giving you a teacher to train you how to live right. Teach like rain out of heaven, showers of words to refresh and nourish your soul just as he used to, and plenty of food for your body, Style, silos full of grain, casts of wine, barrels of olive oil. God is hearing our prayers, your prayers, my prayers. The greater the trouble in the street, the greater the desire of God to pour out his spirit. I believe we're seeing a manifestation of of evil, but oh, the righteousness of God. There's a war going on in the heavenlies, but more are they that be with us than they that be with him. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, Lord, send the rain. Send the Holy Ghost rain. And then in verse 25, God is speaking again, and I will restore you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. I want us to understand, he said he's going to restore the years. That means he doesn't just say, oh, all it's going to look pretty again, but he's going to give back all the lost harvest is what he's saying. 
and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. It's time for rain. It's time for the latter rain. But that was then and this is now and I, we need the rain of the Holy Spirit to be poured out in a deluge upon this assembly. We need the rain of the Spirit to come in torrents across the Vancouver, Portland metropolitan area. The great Northwest is desperately in need of the favor of God. You know, two of the times uh, in, the, in the last century that there was the greatest percentage of church attendance, the Great Depression and immediately following 9-11. When there was catastrophe, when there was fear, where man couldn't control anything, and then they came to seek for God. Perhaps during this time of confusion, perhaps during this time when the enemy has come, you know, here's, here's the answer. If you want to look and see if it's from God or not, God is not the author of confusion. Yeah, right but of peace as in all the churches. If whatever has happened is bringing confusion, it's not of God. God is a God of peace. He's a God of clarity. He's a God of understanding. He'll give clarity to you in this generation and in this day. And he said, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. I have good news. God wants to pour out his spirit and God is going to pour out his spirit. Remember verse number 23 says this. Be glad then ye children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for he hath given you the former rain moderately. He said, when I poured out the Holy Ghost the first time, that was just pitter-patter. That was just a little bit of drops on the roof. That was something that you said, well, I got a little wet, but that's not too bad. Didn't even need an umbrella. And what do we see? We see 120 in the upper room and about 3,000 later and then 5,000 after the man's healed at the gate or at the temple. And then it says, and these that have Turn the world upside down and come hither also. God always saves the best for the last. And I have a sermon on that. Uh, but he always goes better, 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 better. But he says, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. He said, you're going to get it all at the same time. Oh, Lord, send the Holy Ghost rain. You and I remember how the Holy Ghost changed our heart. I remember when God's Spirit moved in and of course there was an explanation or there was an a ejaculation of other tongues. I began to speak in a language I didn't understand. But my heart was communicating so clearly with God. So clearly that when I was told afterwards uh, to praise Jesus, I raised my hands and started speaking in tongues. And the older gentleman, and he was a great guy, said, I said, praise him. Well, that's what I was doing from my heart. It was just my spirit was overflowing. And, and when that happened, there was just clarity. I was a child, but I was an angry child. The angry the anger dissolved. I remember hugging my brothers and sisters. Now, that wasn't little Stephen's normal thing to do. I remember just being rejoicing in my heart and in my spirit. That's what happens. That's what our world needs. Our world needs... Yeah. The reign of the Holy Ghost takes away the confusion and the fear and the animosity. It takes away the passion for the things of the world. And we have a passion for the heavenly. I believe it is time for the latter rain. I believe it is time for the former rain and the latter rain together. The hope of our nation in turmoil is Holy Ghost rain. The only thing that will put out the fires of rebellion of this city is Holy Ghost rain. The hope 
hope for this generation is Holy Ghost reign. The only thing that can will give us any certainty of future is Holy Ghost reign. So how do we ensure the rain will come? What is the role that we must play? I return to our initial text. Ask. Yes. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. This is a prayer request. This is the prayer request of God. And this is a prayer request of God for our day. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. He, we are not asking God for something we want. We are asking God for something he wants. The Bible says in Romans 8 uh, that sometimes we pray in the Spirit uh, and the Spirit makes intercession according to the will of God. You want to know what the will of God for our generation is? Outpouring of the Holy Ghost. He wants to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Don't wait for people to get right to get the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what's going to get them right. Look, Paul had, had a, a whole lifetime of hatred and animosity toward the people of the way. He was breathing out threatenings and slaughters. And then the light came and it blinded him. And he went into the city, Damascus. And Ananias said, hey, Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, who appeared unto thee by the way, has sent me unto thee. He laid hands on him. He received his sight. And he spoke with other tongues. But it took him time to get where he needed to be. But God poured out his spirit three days after he had that encounter. It doesn't take forever to repent and get the Holy Ghost. I know some people are bad people. It's not like you have to read the list off. <laughs> you got to open up your heart to God. Because remember, you'll forget something. Because you've tried to forget some of those things. But God is faithful. We need a Holy Ghost outpouring. And that Holy Ghost changed him. Yes, there is opposition, opposition in our day just as there has been in every age. First John 4 and 3 says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. That was 2,000 years ago. He said the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. Guess what, folks? If you look at a website and you research any of these, these groups, if they don't confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, they're of the spirit of Antichrist. It doesn't matter if it's a political. It doesn't matter if it's a monetary thing. No, that's the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is saying we don't need Christ. We can save ourselves. And they're going to try to do it through one world government, one world finances, and one world religion. It's coming. They're pushing it. And you and I can see how all of that could fall into place very quick. Just look at the fear that has gripped our cities uh, and, uh, and our nation. Uh, they're separating people. And I just watched it. They reinstituted it in Victoria, uh, Australia, that there's a curfew. Uh, and, uh, and now there's a $5,000 fine if you have more than your immediate family in your house. And they don't have to ask. Uh, they don't have to give you a warning. They knock on the door. Up, oh, you don't belong here. There's a $5,000 fine. Uh, they said, we know that the place that most of the disease is spreading is in the family now. So they're trying to keep families apart. That's the spirit of Antichrist. It's in the world. It's working. But oh, listen to the very next verse. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, Lord, send the Holy Ghost rain. Send the rain of the Spirit down upon your church, upon this city. I would like to read to you a few scriptures and give clarity to the meaning of the names of men and places. And this will help us understand the perception of those to whom Zechariah's prophecy was being given. When the death of the, of the patriarch was coming, he gathered his sons around. Jacob gathered his sons around and laid hands on them and pronounced blessings. And in Genesis 29 and 35, it says, and she, 
Oh, this is a little bit earlier. Sorry. And she conceived and she bare a son and she said, Now I will praise the name of the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left off praising him. The lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus. So Judah means praise. And the name of the firstborn child of Rachel tells us a story in Genesis 30 and 23. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. And we know Benjamin was born. And the name of the firstborn child of Joseph tells a story in Genesis 41 and 52. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So I, wanted, I want you to see this. And we're going to read as you stand, please. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse number 2. So we're told to ask for rain in the time of the latter rain. And then verse 2 says, For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore they went their way as a flock that had, were troubled, because there was no shepherd. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock out of the house of Judah, or out of the house of praise, and hath made them as his goodly horse in battle. Out of him came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together, and they shall be as mighty men which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be confounded. And then I want you to hear this, and I will strike strengthen the house of praise. I will strengthen the house of praise and I will save the house of Joseph and I will bring them again to a pl and place them for I have mercy upon them and they shall be as though I had not cast them off and for I am the Lord their God and I will hear them. I will hear them and then I want you to listen to this and they of Ephraim the Lord has made me fruitful in the house of affliction. They of Ephraim, the child given in my place of affliction, shall be as a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I will hiss for them and gather them. I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased, and I will sow them among the people. You see what's happening? He's saying, those, you are my children, you're in the children in the place of affliction. And if you will go with praise, I'll sow you among the nations. What does that mean? You don't sow anything unless you plan on it growing. I was out in my yard yesterday and I, uh, the backyard has a struggle every winter. Because these, these huge trees that are almost 100 feet tall. Some of them are maple trees and they throw these seeds down. And they spin around. We used to call them helicopters because they spin around. And they poke right into the ground, into the grass. So I'm out with my blower. <laughs> Crazy guy getting them out of the lawn. Why? Because otherwise it smothers out the lawn that's there. Just the seed does. And by the time the middle of winter comes, there's nothing but mud out there because the seed is there. God is sowing you and I in this world. He sowed us. Oh, if we will praise the Lord, friends. I know you're taking a risk in this world, but don't be afraid to declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't be afraid to declare his goodness in this world. Don't be afraid to say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be a silent majority. Be a vocal majority. Be a voice of hope. Be a voice of peace. So I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead. Gilead means hill of testimony. 
and Lebanon, and the place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction, and shall smite the waves of the sea, and all the depths, deeps of the river shall dry up, and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. I appreciate your praise. I, I heard it erupt uh, immediately as I was over in the other room uh, when service started. Uh, oh, Judah shall triumph. Yeah. Ephraim and Judah. It's time for us to pray. It's time for us to pray for rain. It's time for us to pray for latter rain. And Hosea 6 and 1 says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us. After two days, he will revive us. And the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. This is a sure thing, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain, and the former rain unto the earth. O oh, Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O oh, Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. Oh, yes, you were born in affliction. That's all right. God's speaking not of the others. He's speaking of the child born in affliction and the child born out of praise. Oh, in your affliction, if you can learn to praise God. Oh, God, send the rain. This altar's open to pray for a rain. This sanctuary's open to petition him.